Great. Welcome back, everyone, to Automotive Linux Summit Europe, which is part of Embedded Open Source Summit Europe. Um, a warm welcome to Matthias Rosmi from KPIT, and uh, he'll talk today about bridging safety gaps in graphics. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. But before we start, a few words about myself and the company I'm currently working at. I am a solution architect and I have worked for the major part of my career on graphics related projects. And currently I'm working at KPIT, which is an automotive supplier providing solutions for infotainment, ADAS, electric drive trains, and other things. Okay, today I will give you an introduction into ACL and the graphics pipeline. I will talk about typical safety gaps in the graphics pipeline and I will show you how to bridge them for safety critical use cases such as telltales and the rear view camera. What is ACL? <clears throat> it is the abbreviation for Automotive Safety Integrity Level, and it is a system to categorize risks by severity, exposure, and controllability. There are four different AC levels from A to D, where A is for the lowest and D for the highest risk, and there is also one off-scale level which is called QM, which is for the risks which are so low that the normal quality management measures are sufficient, so nothing special is needed. For each of the AC levels from A to D, ISO 26262 gives technical recommendations and recommendations for the development process. So a technical recommendation for AC level D, for example, would be to have parallel independent redundancy, but for the lower AC levels like A and B, that is not recommended anymore. There is another recommendation, for example, recursion should be avoided in general for all AC levels because recursions are a possible source of stack overflows and this ISO norm also gives recommendations for development process, testing strategy, and other things. And if you want to read a little bit more in detail about that, I can recommend the document down here that is a very good summary of the ISO norm. So how can we categorize a risk? That is done by the three items, severity, exposure, and controllability. Severity means what could happen in the worst case. Is it death, is it injury, is it only material damage? The exposure is how often is the risk relevant. Please do not mix that up with probability of a failure. That is something different. Exposure here means how often are we in a situation where a certain bad thing could happen. And the last point is the controllability. That means can the driver detect the failure and handle the things in a safe way? I will give you some examples. The electric steering, the severity is very high because if the electric steering does not work as expected, you might cause a crash, and if you're driving fast, the crash might be fatal. The exposure is also very high because the electric steering is needed permanently while driving, <coughs> and the controllability is low because the electric motor of the electric steering is usually stronger than your arms. So as long as you are not a bodybuilder, you have no chance to control the situation. And because of a high severity, a high exposure, and a low controllability, that has the highest possible AC level, which is AC level D. Another example, the air condition. Does not sound dangerous, but let's analyze it. What could happen in the worst case? If it gets too hot in the car, then you might lose consciousness, and you might end up in a fatal crash. So the severity is also very high here. The exposure is medium. In some countries, you need it. In others, you don't but the controllability is very high. So if it gets too hot in the car, you can open the window. If it's still too hot, you can stop driving, get out of the car, and if you are feeling really bad, you can call an ambulance, so it's easily controllable, and therefore the air condition has only AC level A. And another example. <clears throat> what is if the airbag does not open? Of course, the severity is very high, because if it does not open and you have a crash, you will probably die. The <coughs> The controllability is basically non-existent because if the airbag does not open, there is nothing you can do against it, but the exposure is very low. So most people never need an airbag in their whole life, so this risk would normally be AC level A. But we did not consider something. It could happen that the airbag opens without a reason. And let's analyze this case. If an airbag pops up in front of you, you will probably be shocked and maybe, or very probably, cause a crash. So the severity is also very high. 
the exposure is very high because it could happen at any time while driving and the controllability is low because it's uh, very improbable that you react properly when such a thing happens and therefore this risk is categorized as level D. We will not talk about specific AC levels later in this talk, but it is important that you understand if you want to reduce a risk, you have three options. You can reduce the severity, you can reduce the exposure, or you can increase the controllability. The severity and exposure usually cannot be changed, but in many cases it's possible to change the controllability, and that will become important in graphics-related use cases, which I will talk about later. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the graphics pipeline. So how does any graphics output usually work? Of course there are some exceptions, but here I present the standard workflow, <coughs> how graphics is put onto the screen. At first we draw the content into the frame buffer of a window. The frame buffer is just a rectangular array of pixels. Then multiple windows for each screen are merged this process is called compositing. And finally, we show the result on the screen. So how does it look in detail? In this example here, we have two applications. And both applications use a hardware accelerated rendering API, for example, OpenGL or Vulkan, which will implicitly use the GPU to draw the application content into a window frame buffer which is sent to the compositor. In case of Linux, that is usually Western. And application number two does the same. And Western can use OpenGL to merge all the windows from a specific screen that will use the GPU. And then the screen frame buffer is read out by the display processing unit and sent to the display. So that is how the graphics output usually works. And probably you have noticed that some boxes here are green that are components which are either ACL compliant or can be developed in an ACL compliant way. For example, the display processing unit of most SOCs is already ACL compliant. ACL compliant displays are available on the market and you can develop your own applications in an ACL compliant way. But there are a couple of gray boxes here and they are a kind of safety risk. So for example, the graphics processing unit is usually not ACL compliant there's one exception, as far as I know, NVIDIA has AC compliant GPUs and also the corresponding drivers are, but that's not the case for all manufacturers. And also Western, as far as I know, is not AC certified at all until now. <coughs> so we need to build a safety bridge from the applications to the display processing unit. But before I will talk about that, I will also show you a possible shortcut in some scenarios, it is possible that Weston uses the display processing unit directly to merge multiple windows. But there is a technical limitation. The number of windows that can be merged by the display processing unit is limited. And if the number of software windows exceeds the number of so-called hardware planes on the display processing units, then Weston will choose a hybrid compositing approach where some windows are merged with OpenGL and the GPU and some other windows are merged by using the display processing unit. However, for our safety considerations, we must consider the worst case. That means we have to go through all the boxes here and I will show you how to make the thing safe. So the display processing unit of modern SOCs are able to calculate checksums of uh, certain areas on the screen and so that means the Telltale application knows the CRCs of the Telltale icons. Then the Telltale icons are uh, rendered into the frame buffer of the application that can be done with OpenGL, Vulkan, or some other technology. Then the windows are merged by the compositor. So for example, we have the Telltale, we have the speedometer and other windows. They can be put together by using Weston. And then the display processing unit can calculate the CRC of the region on the screen where the telltale should be shown. So that means for each telltale, we have a so-called region of interest from which the display processing unit can calculate the CRC. And then the CRCs of all the telltales are sent to the telltales application. <coughs> and 
then if the CRCs match, everything is probably fine. If the CRCs do not match, then we have a problem. And if we detected a problem, then we have three options. We can try to recover, we can use a fallback, or we can bring the system to a safe state. A possible recovery option would be, for example, to reboot the system and hope that the error does not occur anymore after that. And if the error still occurs, we can use a fallback solution. So for example, we could display the telltale on another screen or print a text message uh, on another screen. Or many cars even have uh, physical telltales as a fallback solution, so they do not only have the display, but below that there are usually some physical telltales, which can be used if the nice display telltales are not available for some reason. Okay, what about the camera? <clears throat> Here the things are a little bit more complex. Here we cannot use the one fits all solution as we have for the telltales because of several problems. So of course we could calculate the CRC of the whole camera image, but that will not work if we add an overlay. So if we add an overlay, it will change the CRC. The same happens if we scale the camera image. It will lead to a different CRC. So in case of the camera, we have to analyze each risk separately and find a solution for that. So which risks do we have? We have the risk that the image on the screen is not updated, so that means the camera image is frozen. And a possible solution is if the CRC of the screen rectangle of the camera image does not change within a certain amount of time, for example, a quarter of a second, the system must react accordingly. React accordingly, again, means either try to recover, try to get a fallback solution, or bring the system to a safe state. So of course we can try to reboot the system, but if the error still occurs, we need a fallback. And in many cars we have multiple displays. We have the central display. We have a display in front of the driver with the instrument cluster. And of course, if the rear view camera, for example, on the central display does not work properly, then we can display it on the instrument cluster display. But not all cars have an instrument cluster display. Some have a traditional instrument cluster with physical needles. And also we must find a solution what happens if the image is frozen on the other screen as well. So that means the last option is to bring the system to a safe state. And a safe state in case of the camera use cases can be just to turn off the displays. Because if the display is switched off, then the driver will see ah, something's wrong with the camera, then the driver can use the mirror, turn the head, or ask another person for help to drive backwards safely. Okay, which other risks do we have? We could have obvious garbage on the screen, but there we do not need a technical solution because the driver will recognize the error and uh, react properly. So, now let's assume the following use case. We have a review camera and nothing behind the car. Let's drive backwards. Oops, there was a child behind the car and the image was cropped. So how can we detect that? We do not have a solution for that until now. And there is also the risk that the image could be delayed. <clears throat> so how can we detect cropped images? So assuming that we have some kind of overlay on the screen, you know, we cannot take the CRC of the whole image, but we can use the CRCs of two diagonal corner pixels. So we just define a one by one pixel region of interest on the display processing unit for which the CRCs are reported. And we also calculate the CRC of the single pixels uh, in the camera application. And if the CRCs match, then the image is probably uh, not cropped. And if the CRCs do not match, then the image is cropped or broken by some other means. <coughs> so here is the data flow again. The camera application calculates the CRCs of the incoming camera image pixels in the diagonal corners. The image goes through the graphics pipeline and the display processing unit reports exactly those two uh, regions of interest back to the camera application. And yeah, if the CRCs do not match, then we have again the three options, uh, try to recover, which is a reboot in most cases, 
we can try to use a fallback solution. If that is not available or not working as well, we can bring the system to a safe state. But there is a problem when we try to verify scaled images. So the red grid represents the pixels on the screen. And uh, below that, you see uh, the pixels of the camera image. And in order to calculate the color of the uh, uh, top left screen pixel, which is used for the CRC, we see that there are four underlying camera image pixels. And uh, when the camera image is passed through the GPU to be drawn onto the screen, <coughs> then the GPU does bilinear filtering. And the bilinear filtering is basically a weighted average of all the pixels which contribute to the corresponding screen pixel. And we do not know how precisely the GPU calculates the weight of the four pixels. So as you see, this pixel of the camera image has the highest weight, this one and this one have a lower weight, and this one has the lowest weight. We do not know how precise that is done by the GPU. So that means the color value of the screen pixel is not deterministic. And there is another problem. In the past, some GPUs have cheated. So that means if uh, they see that a certain input pixel has only a low contribution to a certain screen output pixel, then the input pixel was ignored completely. So that means the color value of the screen pixel is not deterministic at all anymore. So how can we solve that? A possible solution is to calculate the average of the two by two pixel regions in the corners and write back the same value to all the four pixels. That is only a minor change of the image that will not be visible to the driver. That is not relevant for safety because it's only in the corners and uh, this change will be uh, very, very minimal. So we can use that small trick and if we apply the billion filtering now, we see that all the underlying camera image pixels of the screen pixel in the corners have the same color. And if we calculate the weighted average of four exactly same values, even if the weights are not calculated properly, the result will always be the same color. So we have achieved to make the color in the corner deterministic. So we have found a solution for three of the four risks. What is still open is uh, we must detect if the camera image is delayed. But bef before we go to that, let's think again about the image is cropped risk. So we have a small problem with the timing of the CRCs. So when the camera image comes in to the camera application, it will take some time until the new image is visible on the screen. So it has to be rendered, it has to be composited with other windows, and then it's finally shown on the screen. So that means there is a certain time interval where the CRC, which is known to the camera application, and the CRC, which is reported by the display processing unit, do not match. Then when the frame number one is shown on the screen, there is a short time interval where the CRCs match, and then they do not match again but things can become even worse. So if we have a complex graphics pipeline, it could happen that the processing of frame number one takes longer than receiving frame number two from the camera, which would result in CRCs which never match. In order to solve the problem, I suggest the following solution. We can have a list of pairs of the corner CRCs and the corresponding validity end time. And for each set of CRCs which is received from the display processing unit, we can delete all outdated CRCs from the list above, and then we check if the received CRCs are in the remaining list. If not, we trigger a safety warning because it means the screen content is either wrong or outdated. Outdated, we wanted to detect delayed images, so maybe we can use that algorithm for that as well. Let's see. At first, let's think where delays could occur. So delays could occur between the physical camera and the camera application, and between the camera application and the display processing unit. So let's think about that delay here at first. <coughs> if we uh, produce a camera, then we can develop it 
according to the ACL recommendations, we can make sure in the source code of the driver that the frames are never queued anywhere. So that means it is not possible to have a delay here if everything is done properly. But delays can occur between the camera application and the display processing unit, and we must be able to detect them. So can we use the previous algorithm for that? Let's evaluate it. So obviously the algorithm would work to detect delayed corner pixels. But what if only the center part of the camera image is changing and the corners stay the same? Then it would not work. But here the noise of the camera sensor might be handy. Even if the real corner content does not change, the camera will send different corner colors for almost each frame. So that means we can use the combination of the two or even four corner pixels as a kind of identifier for a certain frame. And yeah, now let's have a look at the mathematics. Assuming that we have a low noise camera where RGB alternates only between two adjacent color values in the range between zero and 255, we have two to the power of three that are eight different color values per corner. If we use two corners, we have eight to the power of two that are 64 combinations. If we use all four corners, we have eight to the power of four that are 496 combinations. If the list of pairs from the previous algorithm has four items, the probability that a delayed combination on the screen is in the validity list by accident is only one divided by 1024. Four frames later, the probability is approximately one divided by a million. And another four frames later, the probability is approximately one divided by a billion. So that means we are able to detect delayed frames uh, quite reliably. And in this case, having a low noise camera is a kind of worst case because the more noise we have, the more combinations we have here. So that means a noisy camera would increase the range of possible IDs for the frame. <coughs> and even if the camera has no noise at all, we can still apply the same algorithm because the camera application can inject some noise only to the corner pixels so that uh, the frames can still be identified. So it is basically the same thing as we had when we calculated the two by two average in the corners that is only a minor change to the camera image. Nobody will notice it's not safety relevant, so we can do that safely. So we have found solutions for all the risks uh, that we uh, have found. If the image on the screen is frozen, we can check if the CRC changes or not, and if it does not change, then the system must react accordingly. If you have obvious garbage on the screen, we don't need a technical solution because the driver will recognize the error. If the image is cropped, we can check CRCs of single pixels in the diagonal corners. And if the camera image is scaled intentionally, we can replace a block of pixels in the corners with the average to get predictable filtering results. And we can use the same algorithm also to detect delayed images. But in this case, we should use all four instead of only two corners. And maybe we can add some more reference pixels. So we have successfully built a safety bridge across the unsafe components in the graphics pipeline. And that means we uh, can use Linux also in many safety critical scenarios. That is the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yep, wait for the microphone. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the talk, it was very interesting. Uh, one question I have, um, implementing those algorithms would mean that you need, uh, let's say for example, direct access to the output of the camera sensor where you can implement then um, the checking of the CRCs and stuff. Uh, do you have any experience with, uh, when you're using any additional um, graphic stacks like for example, a G-Streamer or something? Is there any support uh, for checking the checksums or would one have to write a custom uh, GStreamer plugin, for example, or something? Okay, so I just repeat the question with my own words and share the corresponding slide. Ah, here it is. Okay, so your question was uh, uh, if we can uh, calculate the CRCs somewhere here in between, or how direct the camera application can access the physical camera, and if it is still possible to capture CRC if we use GStreamer here in between. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, that is uh, unfortunately not possible, so we need uh, direct access to the camera driver so that other components which are not considered to be safe are avoided in this case, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding to potential errors on the camera pipeline side. Uh, so camera pipelines like to reuse the same buffer and I can imagine a scenario where everything looks, looks really good but the camera does not actually fill in the buffers into, into the recycled buffer. So you may end up, let's say, having six or eight buffers of a past camera state just queuing to the pipeline and visually creating like a updating image but just cycling the, let's say, eight buffers. Uh, how do you deal with this type of problems? So do you have, so is this a simplified, uh, way of dealing it and you actually have to do uh, tracking per buffer on those CRCs and looking up that, you know, a particle CRC does not kind of keep repeating. Uh, I go to the corresponding slide first. Okay. Mm, there was one too far. Okay, here it is. So you mean that the uh, camera itself fills the buffers in a wrong way? Yeah, or yeah exactly. So basically you could queue back the buffers to the camera that, hey, please give me a new buffer, but the camera just keeps the old content. So if you don't zero out the memory, you will possibly get back. Yeah, that is true. So the memory must be zeroed out, yeah. Yeah, so you zero. Okay, thank you so much. So just one question here. You are asking the DPU to give you CRC for different corners based on different situations. Exactly, yeah. So uh, that, that means you need to tell G D the DPU to give you that data. So how do you ensure that DPU, DPU has received that request and sending you the, the CRC of that particular part that you have requested? So that is just a matter of the corresponding DPU driver. So there must be some communication between the application and the driver, and then the DPU will send the corresponding data. Yeah, so there can be some delay of the de delay, and the DPU might send you a delayed CRC? Uh, that should not happen because the DPUs of modern SOCs are designed in an ACL compliant way. And even if there is a delay, then the algorithm that you are seeing here would uh, detect it. So, of course, it would be a false positive, but uh, we would not uh, come into an unsafe situation. Right, okay, thanks. Uh, the gray bit in the middle, like, are there people who want to safety certify that as well, or is that just, there's no reason to do it? Hmm? Pardon? Like, the, so, like, say, Wayland. Does it, yeah. So, like, all of the gray bit in the middle is currently... Let's go to the slides that everybody sees what we are talking about. Mm. Yeah, so we can use that example. Yeah, so, like, is there, I don't know, is there an end goal to actually try and safety certify the other bits in the middle, or is there just no need, like, for someone to come along and try and certify Wayland, or? So you, so you mean that uh, Weston and the other boxes here might become green in future? Yeah, that's the question. Okay. And is there a need for it? Yeah, so, Mm, there is not really a need. Of course, it would be good to have it uh, in an AC-compliant way because then we might not need so many DPU-based checks as I have presented right now. But to, as far as I know, Weston is not uh, AC-compliant. And also, if I have a look at the Wayland API, I have some doubts if it's a good idea to certify it because, in my opinion, it's uh, way too complicated. So for uh, safety critical stuff, APIs should be intuitive to use, so that the risk of using APIs in the wrong way is pretty low, but in my opinion that's not the case for Wayland, so I think Weston will not be AC certified quite soon. And the other two boxes, uh, the GPU and the corresponding drivers, they are uh, AC certified for NVIDIA as far as I know, but 
for other manufacturers that's not the case. I think other manufacturers will follow. I think those boxes will become green in the near future as well. And yeah, what will happen with Western or Valen in general, I'm not sure. Anyway, we can build a bridge over the unsafe components so we are not, uh, so we do not rely on them. Even if they are not safe, we can still make a safe application. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, uh, uh, great overview and the uh, approaches. Uh, first, uh, one note about the air conditioning. Uh, yeah. What if it's cold? Pardon? What if it's cold outside? If it's cold outside, um, then you will probably not lose consciousness. <laughs> That's not a safety risk. <laughs> yes, but if it's minus 30 or 40, then it might be pretty uh, life life threatening risk. But the question itself is uh, about, you mentioned these numbers, probability that we need for errors, right? One over uh, 400, 4,000 and so on, so yeah. on. How you define this border and who actually defines this border? Which probability is acceptable there? Uh, there are some tables on the internet which define which failure rates are uh, acceptable for a specific AC level. Okay, so that that's uh, defined by the ISO, right? The, by the standards or some of these things. I'm not sure if it's a part of the ISO itself, but there are recommendations which are publicly available, which uh, failure rates are acceptable. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you? Uh, and the, the CICs are passed back to the application in hardware, or is that part of the driver? The, so the, in the, the end, the application must communicate with the driver, yeah. So the parts of the driver need to be certified then? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the Telltale application, it's run by the scheduler, or I mean, the, the operating system also needs to be certified? Exactly. So basically, we have three options. So one option is that the SOC has a special safety core. So that is the case for many SOCs in the meantime. So that means the Teltis application can run partially or completely on the uh, safety SOC. We can use uh, virtualization. So that means uh, we have a hypervisor and the main system runs on Linux and a safety critical part runs on safe RTOS, for example. And the third option, will become relevant in the near future. So as far as I know, the Linux kernel itself is going to be AC certified by some companies. And then we can even run safety critical things on the Linux kernel. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can go to lunch a few minutes earlier. Thank you. <laughs>